Hi, everybody. So as promised in the welcome video, this first lecture will be the only lecture that's recorded uh, now in real time in 2020. All of the remaining lectures will be lectures that record, were recorded actually in the classroom, which has some benefit because you'll hear questions being asked by previous students and my answers to them. So this lecture, although uh, I would never categorize it as being short, it'll probably be shorter than the other lectures simply because I'm just going to go through the slides. So what we're going to be talking about today is how to create recombinant DNA samples. Essentially, that means how to clone genes. Uh, we'll talk about some of the details of gene cloning. And then when you all come into the lab to do your first set of activities, one of the things we'll do is clone a gene there in the lab as well. So before we talk about gene cloning, we all basically need an overview of DNA. A lot of these early slides I'll go through quite quickly because I'm sure from your undergraduate experiences, you know DNA quite well. But uh, essentially, DNA is a double-stranded helix, and those two strands are held together by non-covalent forces, hydrogen bonds to be specific, and they're anti-parallel. So on the left of the screen here, we see one strand going from the five prime or beginning end to the three prime or the end end of the strand. It's going five prime to three prime top to bottom. And the strand on the right is going in an anti-parallel fashion, five prime to three prime bottom to top. So that's what we mean by anti-parallel, that the five prime and three prime ends are going in opposite directions on the two strands. We also see that the structural backbone of DNA, if you will, is made up of a very nonspecific repeating phosphate sugar backbone. So here we have a phosphate at the three prime end and then a ribose sugar, and then the next phosphate of the next nucleotide and another ribose sugar down all the way to a free hydroxyl, which marks the three prime end. And we have that same phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar backbone on the anti-parallel strand. In the middle of the DNA double helix are the base pairs, the nitrogenous bases. Four bases make up the language of DNA, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And those bases are paired. Adenine always base pairs with thymine, giving us AT base pairs, and cytosine is always base paired with guanine, giving us CG base pairs. As shown here in the diagram, the base pairs between adenine and thymine consist of two hydrogen bonds, and the base pairs between guanine and um, cytosine consist of three hydrogen bonds, and that makes GC base pairs stronger than AT base pairs. And this has implications with things that we'll talk about later on in the course, such as PCR primer design, annealing temperatures, and things like that. This beautiful schematic really shows in a very brief um, uh, presentation everything that really needs to be known about DNA. So maybe not a bad idea to um, stop the video right now and even take a screenshot of this. So again, we see the phosphate sugar backbone in the upper left. We see the, th the four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and we see their molecular structure there. On the upper right, we uh, have a little write-up on the hydrogen bonds showing the base pairing and how many hydrogen bonds there are between the two base pairs. And then in the lower right, we even have a little bit of central dogma there, which we'll talk about uh, in this course. This is the coding nature of DNA. So DNA genes are transcribed by uh, RNA um, transcription enzymes or machinery transcribed into a messenger RNA sequence. The messenger RNA has a sequence that is very similar to the DNA gene. Actually, the only real exception of any note is that there is no thymine in RNA. So all the thymines in the DNA gene are replaced as uracils in the RNA. But the code is the same. And then through the process of translation, that code in the messenger RNA, which came from the gene itself, is decoded into an amino acid sequence. And that amino acid sequence gives us the protein that we're trying to make all along. So proteins make life possible. Proteins are what catalyze all of the biochemical reactions that are keeping us alive in all ways. Proteins are giving us structural stability, voluntary and involuntary motion. Essentially anything that you equate to healthy life is the direct result of proteins. But cells need to know how to make those proteins and the instructions for building those proteins is what DNA contains. So since DNA is the blueprints of making proteins and proteins are responsible for life, DNA is the blueprints of life indirectly there because it governs DNA um, protein synthesis. Okay. So that brings us to plasmids. Uh, hopefully you've all heard of plasmids before as an undergrad, but just in case you haven't, as a, a quick crash course, 
Plasmids are relatively small, circular pieces of DNA that are naturally found in prokaryotes and bacteria. Um, they're almost like pseudochromosomes in a sense, and uh, a very limited number of genes can be encoded on natural plasmids, and by trading plasmids, bacteria can trade traits such as antibiotic resistance. So plasmids are naturally occurring, but like many things uh, in biology, they have been co-opted and adopted by biotechnology to uh, allow us to do what we'd like to do with living cells more easily. So there are lots and lots of artificial plasmids available on the market now, which are based on naturally occurring plasmids, but have been highly modified. So essentially, again, plasmid is a relatively small, and by that I mean a few thousand base pairs in overall length, relatively small circle of DNA. And it typically consists of uh, three main features when we're using it for biotechnology. The first is an origin of replication, and that you see in the, uh, on the upper part of the plasmid on the screen. An origin of replication is just that. It's where the DNA can first be separated into a replication bubble pulled apart into single strands so that new strands of DNA can be made using those older strands that were just pulled apart as template. That's the process of DNA replication. The other thing that we find on uh, plasmids that we use in the lab is some type of trackable marker. Um, in this case, we see an ampicillin resistance gene. We'll talk a little bit more about how this is used, but in a nutshell here, it's not enough to have a plasmid and to be able to get it into a living cell. We need to verify with some degree of certainty which cells have successfully gotten the plasmid based versus the cells that haven't. What we'll see a lot in biology is that our success rate actually is pretty sucky. Um, because we're dealing with living systems, we don't have the precision and control that chemists and physicists have. So uh, our success rates are pretty low. Therefore, we have to have these little tricks up our sleeve that allow us to separate the wheat from the chafe, so to speak, and only focus on the cells that were successfully modified, disregarding the cells that weren't. So by putting an ampicillin resistance gene on a plasmid, and then growing the cells that we have transformed with that plasmid in the presence of that ampicillin, we can distinguish cells that got the plasmid from those that didn't. Any cell that got the plasmid should have also gotten the ampicillin resistance gene, which means those cells should be resistant to the antibiotic ampicillin and should be able to grow in the presence of ampicillin. Any cell that was not successfully transformed should not have ampicillin resistance and cannot grow in the presence of ampicillin. So by growing cells on ampicillin plates, all the cells that are growing can be um, relatively certain that those cells have successfully gotten the plate. So the last thing we see in this diagram here on the left is a uh, region into which the DNA can be inserted. And that's really the main point of the plasmid. The plasmid is for DNA cloning, for gene cloning. And the cloning of a gene just means to isolate it from its native chromosome, from its native DNA context, and put it into a more easily manipulated form, such as a plasmid. So when we take a single gene and put it into a plasmid, we have cloned that gene. And that region there on the left is where we would like to put that DNA. So again, three main features here, an origin of replication, which is where a replication bubble can form, allowing two new, and in this case, purple strands to be made using the old blue strands as template, uh, ampicillin resistance or some antibiotic marker to track the presence of the plasmid and a region to uh, clone the new DNA into. There's also a unique specific uh, class of plasmids called shuttle vectors. Vector is a uh, synonym for plasmids. Uh, the old school scientists used to use the term vector because a vector is something that transmits something to another species, such as mosquitoes being a vector for um, uh, certain diseases such as malaria, for ticks are a vector for limes. Um, so uh, vectors are things that move biological information from one place to another. And that's what plasmids do. They move genes from one species to another. So scientists have used the term plasmids and vectors uh, fairly synonymously for a while. And these specific plasmids called shuttle vectors are called shuttle vectors because they can move between two species, uh, in this case, between bacteria and yeast. So just as shuttles move between two locations, such as uh, from the airport terminal to the parking lot, from the parking lot back to the airport terminal, and they just go between those two locations, 
Shuttle vectors or shuttle plasmids just move between two species, such as from bacteria to yeast, from yeast back to, back to, uh, back to bacteria. In order to be a shuttle vector, we need origins of replication for each species we're going to shuttle between. So we have a bacterial origin of replication, usually called an OREC. And shuttle vectors also have a yeast origin of replication, called an autonomous replication sequence, or an ARS. To function in bacteria, we need antibiotic resistance genes to track the presence of the plasmid, as I described just a moment ago. But we need a similar system for yeast. In yeast, we use what's called oxytrophic mutants. Uh, we use yeast cells that have been intentionally compromised for their biosynthetic pathways for amino acids and bases, such as leucine, uracil, tryptophan, um, adenine, etc. And the mutant that causes the disruption of that biosynthesis is complemented by a gene that's present on the plasmid. So in this case, the gene that the yeast cell is missing to make leucine, and therefore the cells can't make leucine, and leucine being a critical amino acid, cells will die without leucine. The only way these cells can be kept alive is by being fed exogenous leucine in the media that we grow them on. When we put the gene for leucine biosynthesis on the shuttle vector, now any yeast cell with the vector, with the plasmid, can make its own leucine. If we take cells that we have transformed and grow them on media lacking uracil, yeast cells without the plasmid can't make their own uracil, or leucine, I'm sorry, in this example, it's leucine. Uh, cells without the plasmid can't make their own leucine. The media that we're growing the cells on lacks leucine and those cells will not grow. However, any, any yeast cell that received our plasmid now has the gene for leucine biosynthesis and they can grow on media that lacks leucine because they can make it for themselves. So any cell growing on uracil lacking media has our plasmid. Uh, finally, the multiple cloning site that you see there in the lower left, that's uh, where we put the gene that we're trying to clone. And uh, we also put a brief centromeric sequence in the shuttle vector to kind of fool yeast and make yeast think that the plasmid is a, centri a, a chromosome with a centromere. And that allows it to deal that plasmid out successfully during mitosis. So here's the overview of DNA cloning. Uh, we have our plasmid or vector on the left in uh, yellow, and we have the DNA that we're trying to clone here in green. And as simplistic as it looks, this is really what we're trying to do. We're just trying to cut and paste our green gene into the plasmid and make our recombinant plasmid having cloned our gene. Then we need to manufacture that plasmid. We actually have to clone it, make many, many copies of it. And we typically do that in bacteria. So the next step of the gene cloning process is to transform bacterial cells with our recombinant plasmid. And as the bacteria replicates its own genome, it's going to replicate the plasmid as well, because remember, the plasmid has an origin of replication on it. And as the bacterial cells divide, we'll have more and more of those cells containing plasmid. So we use bacteria essentially as a, as a plasmid-making factory, and then we can lyse those bacterial cells and reclaim our plasmid back out of it. We can isolate the plasmid from cells in that way. I'll just remind you again the purpose of the ampicillin resistance gene. Cells that did not successfully get transformed and do not have our plasmid will die in the presence of ampicillin, whereas cells that did get our plasmid are ampicillin resistant and they'll grow on ampicillin containing media. Now we can clone a single gene with this strategy. We can actually clone multiple genes simultaneously with this strategy. We can even create chromosomal libraries where entire genomes are sheared into small sizes, and each of those sheared fragments is independently cloned into its own vector or plasmid. In any case, though, we ultimately grow the cells that receive those plasmids on the ampicillin-containing plates, selecting specifically for cells that got our plasmid. Okay, so now we're going to dive more deeply into the cutting and pasting of cloning. A couple slides ago, I really kept that pretty brief here and said, well, we're going to cut this green gene and paste it into the plasmid. But really, how do we do that, uh, technically speaking, logistically speaking? Well, the way that we cut DNA with specificity for cloning is with restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that are made by prokaryotic cells. And it's actually, interestingly enough, a rudimentary primitive immune system. Bacteria's number one threat in terms of infection and disease are viruses called bacteriophages. These are viruses that specifically infect 
and lice and kill bacterial cells. So what bacteria have evolved, amazingly enough, is a mechanism to fight off viral infection. Bacteria make these restriction enzymes. Different species of bacteria make different unique enzymes. And these restriction enzymes recognize specific sequences of DNA and cut that DNA. So when a virus enters the bacterial cell with these recognition sequences in its viral genome, these enzymes will immediately recognize those sequences and cut the viral genome up into pieces, rendering the virus inactive. You're probably wondering though, if you remember bacterial cells don't have a nucleus, that's what defines the prokaryotic kingdom. And so the bacterial DNA is floating out there in the cell. The viral DNA is there in the cell. And now we've got these restriction enzymes that are evolved to cut up all of these DNA sequences. Why is it that the restriction enzymes aren't cutting the, the bacterial DNA itself? Why don't bacterial cells kill themselves with these restriction enzymes? And that's because along with restriction enzymes, these bacteria have also evolved a modification system. This is usually the methylation of DNA. So bacterial cells methylate their own DNA and mark that DNA as self. And restriction enzymes cannot cut methylated DNA. They can only cut unmethylated DNA. When the viral genome enters the cell, the viral DNA is not methylated because it's not bacterial and the restriction enzyme will cut it. But since the bacterial DNA is methylated, it is protected from restriction enzyme cleavage. So pretty amazing. How does that factor into gene cloning? Well, again, we've just co-opted this system and use it for our own experimental purposes. On the screen, you see four different restriction enzyme sites for four different restriction enzymes. HEPA-1, HIND-3, ECHOR-1, and PST-1. Uh, there are many, many other restriction enzymes as well. And in class, you're going to be using ECHOR1 as well as a fifth restriction enzyme called BAMH1. Now, you'll see most of these restriction enzymes are what we refer to as six base cutters. They recognize restriction sites that are six bases uh, in length. And those restriction enzyme recognition sites are fairly unique. They are palindromic, which means they read the same on both strands, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. If you look at the Hindi 3 site in the upper right hand corner, the sequence of DNA from 5' prime to 3' prime of the top strand is AAGCTT. And the sequence on the bottom strand, red 5' prime to 3' prime, is also AAGCTT. If you look at all four of these sequences, you'll see that that palindromic nature is true for all of them. Uh, these restriction enzymes cut palindromic sequences, sequences that read the same 5' prime to 3' prime on both strands. Why is that important? Well, that's important because it gives us a pattern of cleavage. If we go back to Hindi 3, what we see with the green arrow is that Hindi 3 cuts the phosphate sugar backbone of DNA between the two adenines of any sequence that reads AAGCTT. So in other words, anytime the Hindi 3 restriction enzyme finds the sequence AAGCTT, it will cut between those two adenines. Well, on the top strand, that cut is on the left. On the bottom strand, that same sequence, AAGCTT, we see the cut is on the right. This off-center cleavage that we see for Hindi 3, ECHOR1, and PST1 results in what we refer to as sticky ends, and we'll see what that means in just a second. HEPA1 is a blunt end cutter. Because it cuts in the middle of the sequence, we get a clean, straight cut right through the DNA, uh, and we don't have any of these sticky end overhangs. So here's what we mean by a sticky end. Again, we're looking at ECHOR1 here, so that's G-A-A-T-T-C, just as we see in the lower left, G-A-A-T-T-C. It's palindromic, so on the top strand, the sequence reads G-A-A-T-T-C, 5' prime to 3', prime, and on the bottom strand, it's G-A-A-T-T-C, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. ECHOR1 cuts between the guanine and the adenine on both strands. We see those cuts diagrammed on top, and now if we pull the DNA apart, we see these single-stranded DNA overhangs, these sticky ends. Uh, it is a AATT sticky end on both strands. Single-stranded DNA loves to base pair with sequences that are complementary, and it is this hunger of the sticky ends to base pair to complementary sticky ends that we're going to leverage to accomplish cleavage. On the right here, we just see the modification system that I referred to before.
If this sequence is methylated by a methylase enzyme in the bacteria, the restriction enzyme will not cut that sequence. It's protected from cleavage, and that's how bacteria protect their own DNA from destruction. Just a quick little diagram showing you a few of the other restriction enzymes that we use and some of the differences that we see between them. Most commonly used restriction enzymes are six-base cutters, but they aren't all six-base cutters. We see ALU1 is a four-base cutter, NOT1 is an eight-base cutter. We leverage this as well in some ways. The shorter the restriction enzyme site, the more frequently we'll find it in a genome. The larger the site, the more infrequent it is. So in other words, if we're looking to cut a genome up randomly into very large pieces, we want an infrequent cutter, we'll use not one. If we're trying to shear a genome into very, very small chunks of DNA, we would probably use ALU1 or SAU-A1 uh, because it's a smaller base recognition site. It's going to have a more frequent um, incidence of restriction enzyme sites. And where the arrow is, this downward pointing arrow in each of these sites, that's the cleavage site. So we see that it, um, ALU1 is a blunt end cutter, uh, SMA1 is a blunt end cutter, but we also have sticky end cutters when we don't have the cleavage site right in the middle of the site. Just to point out here that you can have the same exact DNA sequence cut into different sized and different uh, categorized sites based on what restriction enzyme you use. So it's fairly random where these sites emerge. In this case, this add to DNA has one, two, three, four, five ECHOR1 sites, which cleaves this fragment up into six differently sized pieces. For whatever reason, though, there are many, many more Hindi 3 sites in this very same gene. So we have many, many more fragments that we cleave into. So we choose our restriction enzymes wisely based on uh, their cutting frequency and the prevalence of sequences, uh, restriction enzyme site sequences in the DNA that we're trying to manipulate. All right, so back to sticky ends. Now let's put ourselves in the mind of someone who's trying to clone a gene. This is the sticky end we're left with, read 5' prime to 3', prime. it's AATT, and we want to anneal this hungry sticky end with its complementary sequence. Which one of the sequences in black on the right is this going to base pair to? And hopefully you recognize that it's going to base pair to this one, the third one down. This adenine is going to base pair with this thymine, this adenine with this thymine, this thymine with this adenine, this thymine with this adenine. These are complementary sticky ends, and they will anneal to one another. That's the basis for cloning. So we go into a little bit more detail now in cloning. We still have our plasmid. And this plasmid has its multiple cloning site, its MCS. This is where we're going to clone the gene. It also has an origin of replication, and it has a, a resistance gene to something like ampicillin, so it's a full plasmid. And what we do is we digest the plasmid with restriction enzymes, and we leave sticky ends, and we digest our gene with the same exact restriction enzymes, and we leave complementary sticky ends. And since there's complementarity between the bases here and here, and complementarity between the bases here and here, this gene will base pair into these sticky ends creating this plasmid. Now, we should point out that that base pairing enough is not enough to hold this gene in place indefinitely. We still have a broken phosphate sugar backbone. The structural backbone of DNA is not complete. So we can make new phosphodiester bonds between the bases of these two fragments. We can basically weld the phosphate sugar backbone back in place with an enzyme called DNA ligase. So every cloning strategy ends with a ligation reaction using DNA ligase. So we can get into a little bit more detail now. What we will be doing in class is called directional cloning, and the enzymes that you see on the screen are the very same enzymes you'll be using, ECHOR1 and BAMH1. The reason for directional cloning will become a little bit more clear in just a second, but let's talk through the process first. So first, we're going to isolate our gene of interest and digest it with ECHOR1 and BAMH1, and GOI just stands for gene of interest, some generic gene we're trying to clone. And when we do those digestions, we see we leave sticky ends on both sides. And those sticky ends are different because the enzymes are different. They have different recognition sites. So we have AATT, 5' prime to 3' prime from ECHOR1, and we have GATC, 5' prime to 3' prime from BAMH1. 
We also have a plasmid that we have digested the same way. Uh, I'll back that up for a second. The vector or plasmid that we're using has been digested by the same exact enzymes. And after we do those digestions, we're going to run everything on an agrose gel. We'll tell about, talk about gel electrophoresis in just a second, but suffice it to say for now that agrose gels separate DNA fragments based on their relative sizes. Uh, we call this size fractionation. So larger fragments of DNA run higher on a gel and smaller fragments of DNA run faster or lower on a gel. You can think of these gels as molecular sieves, which separate larger and smaller size fragments. So if we look over here, we see that we have a very small little scrap fragment from our gene of interest and a very small little scrap fragment from our gene of interest here. And this big long piece of DNA is what we want that contains our gene of interest. Well, if this is the longest piece of DNA, it's going to run highest on the gel. And these two lower bands are these two pieces of scrap DNA that we don't want. We're also digesting our vector, our plasmid, with the same enzymes. That's going to be a very large piece of DNA. And then the tiny little scrap that we release from the vector in that digestion. So what we essentially want to do is we want to get the DNA that's here in the gel and mix it with the DNA that's here in the gel add some ligase and seal that cloned plasmid back together. And that's what we do here. So what we see here is the vector, the plasmid with its origin of replication and its antibiotic resistance. It has the complementary sticky ends from the ECHOR1 and BAMH1 digestion. And we've put in here our gene of interest. And by adding ligase, we can seal that all together. In practice, what we would do after running the gel is get a scalpel and we would physically cut this band of DNA, this region of DNA out of the gel. And we would cut this region of DNA out of the gel. We would melt the gel down to liberate the DNA and we would use a purification technique to capture that DNA. So we would end up with a sample tube that contains this DNA pure and this DNA pure separately. And then we take a little bit of this and mix it with a little bit of this and add ligase and we make our plasmid. So again, what we are doing here is we're cutting out this little Echo R1 BAM H1 scrap from our uh, sample. This is the band that we see here on the gel, this little piece of scrap DNA that came out of the vector. And we're cloning the vector that we want. The idea of directional cloning is that the DNA can only go in one orientation. We want our gene of interest going into the plasmid in this orientation from left to right. This DNA can't be cloned from right to left because this sticky end here, this is a BAMH1 sticky end, and it will not anneal to the ECHOR1 sticky end. And this is the ECHOR1 end here, and it's not lined up properly with the BAMH1 end. So directional cloning is used so that we can only clone our gene in one orientation, the orientation that we want, in this case, from right to left. All right, and just to say it one more time so that we get the full story, we are going to have our DNA source. This is genomic DNA, and somewhere in this DNA is a gene that we want to clone. We'll use a restriction enzyme such as ECHOR1 to cut that gene out of the genomic DNA, liberating that gene as we see here, and now it has its sticky ends. We also cut the plasmid with ECHOR1, and that plasmid is going to then yield the same sticky ends. We're going to have complementarity between the gene we're trying to clone and the sticky ends on the plasmid. They're going to line up in base pair, and then we add DNA ligase to seal it all up into one recombinant plasmid. We see that we have an origin of replication and an ampicillin resistance gene, as we should in every plasmid. And we have the polylinker or the multiple cloning site. An MCS or multiple cloning site or polylinker are synonymous. They're two terms for the same exact part of a plasmid. And polylinkers or multiple cloning sites are completely artificial. They're uh, made in a lab and inserted into the plasmid uh, recombinantly. Multiple cloning site is just what we see up here. It is a continuous site that is jam packed with tons and tons of unique restriction enzyme sites. This is almost like a multi-purpose Swiss army knife of sequences that lets you use whatever enzymes are most convenient for your cloning strategy. So we in the lab are going to be cloning a gene using ECHOR1 and BAMH1. And we see that there's an ECHOR1 and BAMH1 site in the polylinker in the multiple cloning site. 
But let's say somebody else was cloning a gene and they wanted to use KPN1 and PST1. Well, they can use the same exact plasmid because this multiple cloning site also contains KPN1 and PST1 sites. So the multiple cloning site or polylinker allows you to essentially use almost any enzyme that you want to clone your gene of interest because all of those sites for those restriction enzymes are present here in the polylinker. All right, so let's get to gel electrophoresis then for those of you that don't have experience with that. I mentioned these gels that we run that we separate DNA based on size. Um, essentially, these gels are a large polymer of agrose. Agrose is a complex sugar from seaweed. Agrose is very, very fibrous. Um, and these gels and the agrose that they're made of basically behave something like jello. So you melt the agrose in water and some buffer of your choosing. The buffer usually contains tris just to keep the pH stable, EDTA to protect the DNA, um, and some type of ion, either acetic acid or um, boric acid, some kind of charged molecule. Um, so you have this semi-solid slab of fibrous polymer that is full of ions, essentially. And what, what use is that? What good is that? Well, as you pour these molten gels, when they're still warm and they're still liquid, you pour them into a tray and you also insert uh, what basically looks like a comb into that molten gel. And the gel hardens as it cools, just like jello would in the fridge. And then you remove the comb. And when you remove the cone, what you leave behind are these voids, these slots in the gel. And this is where you're going to add your sample, your DNA sample. So you put the slab of gel in some type of electrophoresis instrument, an apparatus that allows it to conduct charge, and you flood it with buffer that contains ions, so current can flow. You add your sample to the gel, and you're going to be doing all of this in lab. Over the course of this semester, you'll not only be running gels, you'll be pouring gels as well. But you add your sample to the wells, to these slots in the gel, and then you put a charge on. So you hook this up to a power supply so that there's a positive charge at the bottom of the gel and a negative charge at the top of the gel. So let's take a moment and kind of zoom out and just consider what it is we have here. What we have is a fibrous semi-solid matrix with our DNA embedded in the top of it in these slots or these wells. And now we're subjecting this to charge, positive charge at the bottom and a negative charge at the top. The phosphate groups on the DNA backbone are negatively charged, so DNA has an inherent strong negative charge to it. Opposites attract and like charges repel, so the DNA is going to be repelled from the top of the gel. It's going to be attracted to the bottom of the gel. That means the DNA wants to run down the gel. But how quickly the DNA can run down the gel is a function of its size or length. Because of all those crisscrossed Poly polymerized uh, agrose polymers, those agrose fibers, smaller fragments are going to be able to migrate and navigate and twist and turn and make their way through the gel much faster than large bulky fragments that have a more cumbersome, clumsy migration through the gel. So the smaller the DNA fragment, the faster it migrates through the gel and wins the race to the positive charge. The, the larger the DNA, the, the longer the fragment, the slower it runs. So we begin to separate our DNA based on size with smaller bands of DNA representing DNA of smaller lengths and larger bands of DNA closer to the top of the gel being uh, DNA of longer lengths. The last thing we'll say is that DNA isn't inherently visible. So most of these gels are cast or poured or made in the presence of a molecule called ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide is, uh, to be fancy, an intercalating agent. That simply means that its structure allows it to slip in between the bases of the DNA back of the DNA double helix. So DNA collects ethidium bromide as it moves through the gel. Ethidium bromide sticks to DNA, for lack of a better term. And ethidium bromide fluoresces orange under UV illumination. So when we put our gels on a UV light box, the ethidium bromide will illuminate where it's most concentrated, and we'll see these orange glowing bands of DNA. This image obviously isn't in color, uh, but it shows the illumination. What we're actually seeing with our naked eyes is concentrated ethidium bromide, but the reason why the ethidium bromide is concentrated in these bands is because the DNA present there has collected it. Uh, and so we visualize our DNA. We can see it with our naked eye there in the gel. 
So what we see here are two examples of what we refer to as molecular weight ladders. Um, these are standards that we include on all of our gels. These are DNA fragments of known size in base pairs. So we have uh, 220 kilobases, 2.5 million bases, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a much smaller ladder where we have from 6,000 bases to 1,000 bases or from 6 kb to 1 kb. But what we see are these illuminating bands. So these discrete bands represent a very, very large number of identically sized DNA fragments that have migrated to the very same position on the gel and have accumulated ethidium bromide along the way so that they're visible to the naked eye. Now, we often use these molecular weight ladders to guesstimate the size of our DNA. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, if 1,000 base pairs runs right here on the gel, and 6,000 base pairs runs right here, the size of the DNA in this band, its length is probably close to 3,000 base pairs because it's right between 1,000 and 6,000. So we can kind of eyeball the length of our DNA in that way. But we can also get very, very precise about it as well. Using semi-log paper, we can graph the known length of the DNA in each band, which is given to us by the manufacturer of the ladder. Wherever we buy the ladder from, we're told the size of each of these bands in DNA length. So we can plot that base pair length here on the y-axis, again, semi-log. And then with a ruler, we can measure in centimeters how far down the gel each one of these bands has traveled again, in length, in centimeters. And what we can do is plot migration on the gel versus size of the band, and we can get a standard curve. Now, let's say that your band of DNA moved exactly 2.1 centimeters or 21 millimeters down the gel. Well, then we use the curve. This is 21 centimeters. We would come up until we intersect with the curve. We would go across and we would see that that DNA fragment is exactly 5,000 base pairs in length. So we can both guesstimate by eye, but we can also precisely calculate using uh, a standard curve, the size of your unknown sample in the gel. Okay, so now we have a few of the tools that we need for cloning. We've talked about plasmids themselves, their origin of replication, their antibiotic resistance marker, the multiple cloning site or polylinker. We have have also talked about restriction enzymes and how they're used to create sticky ends, which we can use for directional cloning, leveraging both the DNA that we're trying to clone as well as the polylinker. And we have our gels that we can use to separate the scraps of DNA that we don't want post-restriction digest and isolate the DNA fragments we do want because we can cut them right out of the gel. And if we can only get our hands on that DNA and mix it together, then we're home free for cloning. And that's what we're going to talk about here, which is DNA purification based on salts and pH. So... Once we have cut our fragments out of the gel, the DNA fragments out of the gel, and we want to purify the DNA exclusively and get it away from all the other impurities of the gel, we can melt that gel down with heat, and then we can use this uh, salt-based DNA purification technique. Well, we're going to be doing this in a column format. We're going to be using uh, column purification in the lab, but you can also do it in a couple of other ways. Essentially, what we do is we start the process under high salt conditions and low pH. Under high salt, the DNA molecule is stripped away of all water, and that strong negative charge of the phosphate sugar backbone is exposed when we have high salt conditions uh, and pH is acidic. The matrix that we're using to purify the DNA, whether it's embedded in a column as part of a filter paper or some other matrix, is a positively charged rate uh, matrix. And in, in the case of the kit we'll be using, it's going to be a silica membrane. So silica has a positive charge. Now, if the DNA is strongly negatively charged and the silica is strongly positively charged, the DNA is going to stick to that silica membrane and it'll be captured. Remember, the only thing keeping the DNA so negative is that we're in high salt and all the water has been excluded from DNA. It's not coated in a hydration shell, in other words. When this is the case, under those high salt conditions, we can wash this DNA. So we can run a lot of wash buffers through our silica membrane and, pure, and clean away all the impurities that were also present in that sample. 
Once we're confident that the DNA sample is quite clean and quite pure, we can switch from high salt to low salt and from low pH to high pH, reintroducing water back into the sample. That water is going to complex with the negative charges of DNA, forming a hydration shell around DNA. That is going to shield those negative charges away from the silica, and now the DNA will be eluded off of the silica membrane and it will flow through our column into the capture tube that we wanna collect that sample in. So essentially we have the DNA band in the gel, we melt the gel and liberate the DNA and then we hit that with high salt so that the DNA is very strongly negative and we put that DNA on a positively charged silica membrane which captures it. We wash and wash and wash that until the only thing left on the silica membrane is the DNA we want and then we swap high salt for low salt, which hydrates the DNA, shields the negative charge, eludes it from the silica membrane, and allows us to capture it in a fresh, clean tube. Oops. This can be done for free DNA molecules, but we can also use this technique to capture DNA that is uh, included in protein particles and even included in vesicles or cell membranes. We usually have to use a little bit of detergent to get that to work, um, but it's, it's doable. We can capture DNA in all these forms. Okay, so now let's bring all of this together into one story. We have a gene that we wanna isolate and clone. What that means is that we wanna take that gene out of its native context and put it into a plasmid where we can manipulate it and isolate it. We cut the gene of interest with two different restriction enzymes, such as ECHOR1 and BAMH1, generating sticky ends. We cut our plasmid with the same two enzymes. Those enzyme restriction sites would be found in the polylinker. And we generate in a, a vector with those sticky ends. The vector also has an origin of replication and antibiotic resistance, so we can track its presence in cells later on. We run all of those restriction digest reactions on a gel. And yes, we get some scrap pieces of low molecular weight that we don't want, but we also see bands of high molecular weight, which represents the gene of interest and the plasmid respectively. We cut those bands out of the gel and purify it using the high salt silica system I just described. And once we have these two DNA fragments in pure form, we can mix them together. They'll only base pair with one another appropriately because of the, def the directional cloning, they won't anneal upside down or backwards, so to speak. And then we can use DNA ligase to seal the phosphate sugar backbone, making one single recombinant plasmid containing our gene of interest. Then we add that cloned plasmid, that recombinant plasmid to bacterial cells, and the bacterial cells will replicate that plasmid. And as the cells divide, they will make more plasmid for us until ultimately we have grown as many cells as we want and we can lyse them and purify the plasmid from those lysed cells. You're going to be doing all of this in the first few weeks of class. You will be cloning a gene using directional cloning, cutting a gene of interest as well as a plasmid. You'll be running agrose gels, purifying DNA, doing ligation reactions. You're going to do an E. coli transformation as well as a yeast transformation. And you're gonna be purifying plasmid out of E. coli using the mini prep technique. So everything we've described today, you will be doing in the lab. I'll just remind you that when we grow these cells, we have to grow them in the presence of ampicillin so that only cells that have gotten our plasmid survive and all the unsuccessfully transformed cells die in the presence of ampicillin. Just a few quick things to bring to your attention here at the graduate level. You, this wouldn't be a complete discussion on gene cloning if we didn't talk about some of the few less common but still fairly frequently used techniques that are out there. Um, scientists often use yaks, especially yeast geneticists such as myself. A yak is a yeast artificial chromosome. What we mean by an artificial chromosome is that even though this is a circular piece of DNA, uh, it has a centromeric sequence, so the cells are fooled and think that this is a chromosome because it has a centromere. They'll grab onto this during mitosis and separate plasmids to opposite sides of the cell. Here's that autonomous replication sequence that I mentioned a little bit earlier. That's a origin of replication for yeast so that this plasmid can be copied. But what really makes a yak a yak is that there are pseudotelomeres in the plasmid. These are telomeric um, sequences. You may remember from your undergraduate days 
that telomeres are the caps or ends of chromosomes. They keep chromosomes from shortening with each round of replication. And yeast recognize chromosomes in their genome as DNA molecules that have centromeres and telomeres. And so to fool yeast into thinking this plasmid is a chromosome, there are these telomeric sequences in the plasmid as well. Also, in addition to cloning DNA, what we can do is label DNA to make it visual. I talked a little bit about ethidium bromide, but we can label DNA in a number of different ways to make it more easily viewed experimentally. And one of those ways is by um, adding a radioactive isotope or a biological molecule to the end of DNA. Uh, we don't use radioactivity quite as much as we used to in the past, although it is sometimes used. Uh, we use DIG a lot more often. DIG is short for digoxygenin. Um, here, what we see is a standard nucleotide. We have the three phosphates. We have the ribose sugar. We have an adenine base. So this is a, a DATP. But added to the adenine is this DIG molecule. Now, this DIG molecule can be bound by antibodies or even chromogenic reactions, reactions that change color in the presence of DIG. So essentially, we can find our DNA molecule of interest by looking for DIG, since DIG is attached to the adenine that we've embedded in our molecule. We call that labeling um, because it allows us to see or label our DNA of interest. And anytime we make a labeled DNA molecule, we typically refer to it as a probe because it allows us to find other DNA molecules through the specificity of base pairing. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that we have a, a fluorophore, a um, fluorescent molecule that binds to DIG. Maybe we have a light blue fluorophore that binds to DIG or a yellow one or a green or a red or purple. Now, when we add that fluorophore, it's only going to bind to DIG. And DIG is only going to be present where we have added it to our probe. What is a probe? Well, a probe is a single-stranded DNA molecule that has been labeled in some kind, either radioactively or through DIG or through fluorescence, etc. So when we take this chromosome, we apply a little bit of heat to it so the DNA loosens. The two strands of the double-stranded DNA molecule begin to separate a bit. Now we add our single-stranded probe. What is that single-stranded probe going to do with this loosened heated DNA? It's going to bind wherever it can find a complementary base pair sequence. And once it binds, it's going to stick there permanently. And if it's labeled, we'll be able to see it. So what we're actually looking at in this diagram are chromosomes where specific genes have been labeled with fluorescence because single-stranded probes with sequences complementary to the sequences of those genes are sticking to the DNA here and quote-unquote lighting this DNA up. So this is fluorescent labeling. We can also use laboring, labeling through hybridization on other techniques. Hybridization is, again, where we have this single-stranded probe that is easy to see, base pairing with our target gene sequence, which is invisible to see. If there's complementarity between the probe and our target, we're going to have the probe base pair to the target, and now we can see our target DNA because the probe was visible. Where this is used most commonly is in a procedure called the southern blot. Uh, southern blots have been around for quite some time, and they were modified to also be northern blots. The naming is a little bit strange. Uh, just to clear that up, there was a molecular biologist a very long time ago, time ago named Edwin Southern, Ed Southern. And Edward Southern developed this technique, and he named it after himself. It was very, very powerful. We still use this today, over uh, half a century later. Um, and so he rightfully took credit for it and called it the southern blot. When that technique was modified to be used for RNA instead of DNA, they kind of kept this southern homage or credit, and they called that a northern blot. So a northern blot is a southern blot, but modified for RNA. Much, much later, the same kind of principles and the same general technique was used for labeling proteins. And so keeping with compass directions, we called that a western blot. Uh, there's no eastern blot yet, but perhaps one day somebody will invent one. So the way a southern blot works is you take some heterogeneous sample of DNA, let's say like a chromosomal preparation, and you run it on a gel. 
So what happens to DNA when you run it on a gel? It separates based on size. Smaller fragments are near the bottom of the gel. Larger fragments are near the top. But remember, this is a heterogeneous sample, uh, almost an entire genome. You can think of it as that. So if our gene of interest lies in some discrete spot on the gel, let's say right here, we'll never see it on this gel because there's gel is loaded with DNA from all across the genome. So what you do in a southern blot after running the gel is you set up the blot. The blot consists of the agros gel, and then on top of the agros gel, you put something like a nylon or nitrocellulose membrane. Uh, these are membranes that are positively charged, so negative DNA sticks to them very, very efficiently. Over that membrane, you put a whole bunch of paper towels and a heavy weight. Now, what's going to happen overnight is those dry paper towels are going to wick all of the moisture out of the agros gel. And as the moisture is drawn out of the agros gel, the DNA is going to be drawn out with it. So the DNA gets wicked upwards. As the buffer solution goes through the membrane and is absorbed by the towels, the DNA itself is going to stick to the membrane because of that negative positive electrostatic interaction. So when you come in the next day and you peel that membrane off of the gel, you now have a blot or an imprint of all of that DNA stuck to the membrane. The DNA is out of the gel and it's on the membrane, but it's still separated in that size fractionation pattern. We've just basically made an imprint of the gel on the membrane. The reason why that's important though is because when the DNA is in the gel, it's inaccessible to any probe. When the DNA is on a membrane, it is very accessible because it is not embedded in anything. The probe has access to the DNA. So now we add our single-stranded probe. Remember, this is DNA that's been labeled with radioactivity or fluorescence or DIG, something that we can easily see. Through complementary base pairing, our probe will only base pair to our gene of interest because that's the only sequence it can base pair to. All of the other DNA on the blot is ignored by the probe. And then when we develop the probe, when we visualize the probe, uh, we see discrete bands, and that's where our gene was present in the gel. So we've essentially pulled the needle out of the haystack, and we see our DNA gene on the gel. Um, one last quick point here. The membrane, as I said before, is positively charged. That's what makes DNA stick to it. The probe is DNA as well, so it's also negatively charged. So the way I've just described it, there's really nothing stopping the probe itself from adhering to all of the membrane. Uh, so prior to adding the probe, we have to do what's called a blocking step. We actually add a whole bunch of nonspecific DNA, and that nonspecific DNA saturates the membrane. And so we uh, only have our probe labeling where it can have find complementary base pairing. Similar techniques can be used to visualize the presence of genes in living cells. What we see here on the left are zebrafish embryos, and we're using a technique called in situ hybridization. In, in C2 hybridization, the DNA probe is base pairing to the gene of interest right there in the cell uh, as the cell is still living. So in C2 means in the situation of. So the hybridization is occurring within the living context of the cell. In this case, we're actually hybridize, hybridizing to RNA. So what we're seeing is the expression of a specific gene in certain regions of the zebrafish embryo. All right, so a quick wrap up here, just a little bit of a matching. Probably pause the video if you would and see if you can match the right terms to the right uh, definitions. I'll let you pause and then I'll give you the answers to see how well you did. So origin of replication allows the initiation of replication by recruiting replication factors, that should say. So one goes to C. Antibiotic resistance gene, well, that links to D, it confers the ability to grow under certain conditions. A selection marker, well, that goes to F, that confers the ability to grow in the presence of an antibiotic. Uh, four goes to um, transcription being driven. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the course. Our gene of interest is what we're trying to clone. Um, that's going to be the inserted gene, or E, that we're putting into the plasmid. And finally, the restriction site. Well, that's B, the location of DNA recognized by restriction enzymes that allow the cloning to occur. So hopefully this was review, or somewhat of a review for many of you, but certainly it's important to start 
uh, somewhere in this course, and it seemed that in a course of applied DNA biology, we start with the basics of DNA cloning. We will move on to more specifics about DNA transformation and isolating DNA from li living cells in our later lectures, and that will be lectures two and three, respectively. So until then, uh, thanks for watching, and have a great week. Bye.